and binatorics and integrable systems. And the speaker today is Anton Zorich. So please, Anton. So I, I'm really grateful to those who are still here after two weeks of very intense and interesting school. And I would like also to thank the, as, as a speaker of the last lecture, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this school. At least I liked it very much. And also I'm happy to be in St. Petersburg. So here is the end of my story. And this is sort of the goal of my story. And I will start with a short reminder. Uh, the first point of the reminder is a reminder of intersection numbers of psi classes. So these objects appeared several times. In particular, they were omnipresent in the last two lectures of Dimas Vonkin. So we have a collection of very natural line bundles over the model A space MGN. These line bundles are well called tautological bundles. Uh, there's the cotangent lines uh, at the first point, at the first mark point, second mark point, and so on. So these are the tautological line bundles Li. They, they are extendable to MGN bar. And uh, the first churn classes of these line bundles are denoted by psi i. And then you can multiply this psi one, et cetera, up to psi n taken to some powers. And the integrate the result over MGN bar when the powers are d1, et cetera, dn, I arranged in such way that the sum of the powers is equal to 3g minus 3 plus n, which is the complex dimension of, MG, of MGN. Uh, the resulting number is a non-negative rational number. So, sorry, positive rational number. So when this condition is satisfied, it's positive rational number, which are called intersection numbers. And they appear in very different problems and in very different situations, in particular in combinatorics. We have seen, yeah. Uh, so one of the ways they appear in combinatorics is the following one. If we wrap all these numbers for fix, fixed G and N into a polynomial, introducing at the first step uh, formal variables, B1, et cetera, Bn. Uh, so if we'll wrap these numbers into a polynomial, recalling their entries d1, et cetera, dn, uh, by the powers of our formal variables. So this b power 2d is b1 power 2d, b1 power 2d1, et cetera, bn power 2dn. So then, and if we use as coefficients, uh, our intersection numbers slightly rescaled by power of two and by product of factorials of Ds, then the resulting polynomial is responsible for the number of metric ribbon graphs of genus G with n boundary components uh, of length B1, et cetera, Bn. And this allowed us, allowed us to count square tiled surfaces. So we decomposed a square tile surface chopping each maximum horizontal, horizontal cylinder. Then we use the fact that the resulting connected components are metric ribbon graphs. We computed, we used our result on count of metric ribbon graphs. And this allowed us to compute square tile surfaces. And I said, we can forget about all details. I suggest to recall only two issues which are important to me. First issue is that to every square tile surface we can associate a stable graph. And for fixed G and N, there is a finite number of stable graphs corresponding to this G and N. 
and we were counting square tile surfaces tiled with at most n squares corresponding to each individual stable graph. Now, this is one thing. So their total count of square tiled surfaces is partitioned with respect to finite number of stable graphs corresponding to given fixed pair G and N, and we compute square tile surfaces graph by graph by graph. And for each graph, we use this decomposition, use our count of metric ribbon graphs, and the main ingredient which shows up in the final formula is this uh, polynomials which were defined on the previous slide. So finally, the very last remark is that uh, it is visible already in the model simplest case of square tile torus here. So all square tile tori should be seen as corresponding to one stable graph. So our polynomial in B is particularly simple here. Uh, just, yeah, yeah, of course, you can, you can sit down here, you can sit down below, whatever you prefer. So what, yeah, yeah, there probably it will be better visible, yes. So what is important for me is that there is a hidden variable H, which is this height of their cylinder in which we chop our torus. And actually when we count square tile tori, uh, we have to count square tile tori where H is equal to one, H is equal to two, H is equal to three. And what was probably not instantly visible in this comp computation is that for any fixed H, the contribution to the entire count of square tile tori has the same order of magnitude of N as the total contribution. So the total contribution, so we have approximately the, the leading term in, in the count of square tile tori tiled with at most N squares is N squared over two times zeta of two. And if we if we'll count the number of square tile tori uh, where each is equal to one, instead of zeta of two, we'll obtain n squared over two times one. If we'll count the square tile tori uh, where the height h is equal to two, then instead of this zeta of two, we'll have one fourth, one over two squared. For h equal to three, we'll have one over three squared, and so on. So my point is that it might be sort of counterintuitive that when we fix H, we fix one of coordinates. So usually when we fix one of coordinates, the integral uh, for a fixed coordinate is equal to zero. Uh, here, the coordinates B and H do not have the same rights, they're asymmetric and any fixed H contributes some non-zero part of their entire count of square tile tori. And when we sum over all possible H, we get a series, this series is converging and we get zeta of two. But still for H equal to one, we already have contribution one to this zeta of two. For H equal to two, we have contribution one fourth for h equal to three, we have contribution one over nine. So any h gives some non-zero contribution. Okay, this is the- I this. have a question about this picture. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, so uh, why is it, uh, why is it, uh, why we can assume that you can just cut a torus uh, in this uh, in this one direction and you, want to, you get a kind of cylinder without kind of being a little skewed? It is skewed. I'm. It, the skewness is hidden in this twist parameter phi. No, but, but why do you, you have just one twist parameter rather than two twist parameters? Oh, I see. Why, why can you always get rid of one of those twists? I have square tiling. So I, I have already square, I, I do have square tiling and I know it. I, I'm not sort of, I'm not saying that my torus is square tileable. <laughs> it is tiled. 
So, and I have the styling, I have uh, a horizontal direction defined by this styling, I have vertical direction defined by this styling, and then I can take any vertex of my tiling, consider the horizontal circle passing through this vertex. Well, it's, it's even better working with Tori, like for M11, it's better to imagine that you have a marked point. You can mark a point at any, any and it's, it's marked at the vertex. And then you just consider the horizontal line passing through this marked point, and you chop your torus with respect to this horizontal line, and you get a cylinder exactly as in the picture. When you open up the torus to the cylinder, you get this, you have to re memorize this twist parameter phi, but you see it is, um, how should I say? I agree that if you consider any flat, abstract flat torus, the fundamental domain of an abstract flat torus endowed with a vertical direction, it's rather a parallelogram. So abstract parallelogram. Here, just a, here we use this extra structure of square tiling. So we know that the horizontal circle is closed which is, which is not true for abstract torus, for abstract flat torus. So we have extra data here. So you basically start at this fixed point and then you just, just start cutting along one of the directions and then just see where, when it closes. And yes. that what defines your, your yes. bottom boundary. Okay, got it. Yes. Thanks so much, sorry. Yeah, since we have finite number of squares, I know that it will close up. Thank you. And the same is, well, the, and that, not the same, but analogous statement is valid for more general situation of abstract square tile surface. Okay, and then this is, there is a formula for their asymptotics of, so this is the coefficient in the leading term of the number of square tile surfaces of genus G with N points having con angle pi. You don't need to look, this, so this is just the proof that the formula exists, exists and the only thing which you have to remember about this formula is that it, it is a sum of all possible uh, stable graphs. And for each stable graph, you have some expression in terms of intersection numbers of psi classes, which is involved. So this is the end of the reminder. And now I would like to recall what problem I would like to solve. This is something, well, this approach to sort of probabilistic approach to non-probabilistic areas of mathematics is, I would say, relatively, relatively recent with respect to the age of mathematics. And here, I would like to give you a couple of examples just to, to, to fix the setting. So, of course, it is meaningless to speak about random integer numbers because there is infinite number of integer numbers. And still one can make sense of a notion of uh, random integer number in the following way. We'll introduce a parameter capital N. N and instead of considering all say positive integers, we'll consider only positive integers in their segment from one to n capital. And then we can consider this integer numbers as equidistributed. So the probability of each of them is the same. Take by random one of them and ask, for example, what is the probability of getting, choosing a random integer in this interval from one to n capital, where I assume that n capital is very, very large. And what is the probability that our integer number would be prime? Well, this is exactly the statement of prime number theorem. In this set, in this interpretation, the prime number theorem says that the probability, the asymptotic probability when n capital tends to infinity is of the order log n over n. Uh, actually, one can, enhance this result. Uh, if you have a 
an integer n, you can consider the prime decomposition of this integer n, and one can compute the number of prime factors of this number of n counted without multiplicities, which are powers of prime. So when we have a prime decomposition like this, uh, my function omega of n is equal to k, just because there are k distinct primes which are involved in the prime decomposition. So, and one can repeat the same story, you consider a huge interval from one to n capital when capital is very large, and you take an integer number by random, and you ask what is the distribution of this function omega as omega of n, considered as a random variable. So now n is a random integer in a huge interval from one to n capital. We have random variable omega of n. What, is, what can be said about this random variable? Uh, and Erdoskat's theorem says that if you normalize your random variable appropriately, so if you subtract log log n and divide by square root of log log n, then the resulting rescaled random variable is already normally distributed in the limit when n tends to infinity. And there are subsequent results of Selberg and, and further results. So it's, it is just the Erdoskat's theorem is the beginning of a beautiful story and beautiful friendship. Uh, there is a similar result, another example, which is even closer to my story is the story about random permutations. So fix now as, as parameter, we use n cap, n, uh, sorry, small n, and we consider the symmetric group Sn, the group of permutations of n elements. As soon as we have a permutation sigma in this group, we consider the decomposition of this permutation in the product of disjoint cycles. And we can compute the number of disjoint cycles in this decomposition. So decomposition is unique. And given a permutation, we at the beginning, so in the yeah, at the beginning, we assume that all our permutation are equally distributed, so have same probability to be chosen. We take a random permutation of an element, and one can ask what is the probability that it decomposes into exactly k cycles. So there is a formula for the number of permutations having exactly k cycles. So this, the, the corresponding object S and K is called the unsigned Stirling number of the first kind. It is immediate to see that the probability that our permutation has a single cycle. So just a, a huge long cyclic permutation. It's one over N because the number of all permutations is unfactorial the number of cyclic permutations is n minus one factorial. So this is really easy to compute. Now, it is not excessively complicated to compute the, the mean number of uh, cycles and the variance. They were computed by Goncharov, but not by Sasha Goncharov, by, by other Goncharov long ago. Uh, and again, if we normalize our random variables, so if we consider the kn of sigma is the random variable which tells how many uh, non-intersecting cycles has permutation sigma in its cyclic decomposition. So if we subtract this mean value normalized by square root of variance, so again, the theorem of Goncharov says that we have normal distribution. Now, why I'm making propaganda for this approach? It, this is already something I would say more recent, but it happened already many times that people try to prove, for example, existence theorem for some geometric objects. And ironically, geometric objects, sorry, depending on some parameter. And it might be a graph. So you want to construct expanders or you want to study, I don't know, a spectrum of Laplace operator on a surface, a hyperbolic surface of Laginus or 
all kinds of problems like this. Or you want to, to, to construct something and all the efforts somehow do not allow you to, to construct an object. And then you apply the following approach. You consider a random object in the family of objects. And surprisingly, it many, in many situations, it is easier to prove that a random object in certain family has the desired properties than to construct a single example. So it happens, for example, it is, not, it is not a theorem, it is a conjecture, and this is a project in progress of Malini Anantaraman and her collaborators. Uh, she tries to prove the following all conjecture in spectral geometry. So the conjecture in some sense goes ba back to Selberg, but in this state, in this formulation, it's rather uh, due to, well, in Maria Mirzahani, Alex Wright, and, and, and other people. So that if you take a random hyperbolic surface of large genus G and compute the smallest non-zero uh, eigenvalue of Laplace operator, I assume that the area of the surface is known. So, uh, then it, it, it would be one fourth minus epsilon where epsilon tends to zero as genus grows. And up to very recently, there were not even known examples of surfaces of sequence of surfaces of growing genus where the first eigenvalue would tend to one fourth. Recently, such examples were constructed using random covers. And Nalini is trying to prove that if you take by random a hyperbolic surface, then with probability, which tends to one as genus grows, there it would have this property. So this is just, so the entire philo, philo, philosophy that in many situations, it is much easier to work with the random objects. And, and we were particularly interested in the, sorry, in there, we were interested in the particular case of square tile services and multi curves. So the questions we, which were, we tried to study and study it were the following ones. So yesterday I already showed that the questions about multi-curves can be translated to questions about square tile surfaces and vice versa. So I will formulate the questions in two languages. The first language is the language of multi-curves. So suppose you have a random multi-curve in the very same sense as random integer number, random permutation. So I fix some hyperbolic metric on the surface. I consider all multi-geodesics of length at most milliard. Uh, the number of such multi-geodesics is now finite because I imposed uh, about the upper bound for the length. And I can take randomly one of them, assuming that the probability of each multi-geodesic is the same. So I study properties of randomly chosen multi-geodesic, and then I take the, I change the bound for the length, I increase it, I repeat the procedure, and I try to find some asymptotic properties as the bound tends to infinity. So in this sense, one can speak about random Multi-curves. So now the questions, the, at least, well, the, the tones of natural questions, for example, the simplest one is the following. Suppose that we have a simple closed geodesic, just the simplest possible multi-curve. One component, weight one, simple closed geodesic. Which simple closed geodesics are more frequent, separating or non-separating? Now, more general questions concerning concern uh, more general multi-curves. Take a random non-primitive multi-curve like this. So just 
something like on the picture, I don't know how many components there are. I don't know what are the powers, the, the weights, M1, et cetera, Mk. I don't know what is K. Now, there, there is infinite choice, choice for this M1, et cetera, Mk. Consider the associated reduced multi-curve. Just forget about these weights and consider the multi-curve gamma one plus, plus et cetera, plus gamma k. Now, the advantage is that there is already a finite number of topological types of reduced multi-curve. And the question is what can be said about the topological type of this reduced multi-curve? So with what probability it slices the surface into one, two, three, et cetera, there might be up to two G minus two connected components. So what is the sort of typical number of connected components by which the reduced multi-curve slices the surface. Another question is with what probability it has K is equal to one, to two, to three, what is the typical number of components? And further questions are what can be said about typical weights, M1, et cetera, Mk, are they small, are they large, and so on. So here, this picture describes the answer forgetting about the weights. So it gives the frequencies of reduced multi -curve. So the setting is we take a, an abstract general multi curve on the surface of genus two randomly. We look at the topological type of the corresponding reduced multi-curve. And here you see the frequencies. Excellent. So this is computed using the formula of Mirzahani. So this is exactly here she, she uses the values of intersection numbers of psi classes. This is one of the explanations why all these numbers are rational. They're explicitly computable. Life is beautiful, but when we go to genus three, there are already 41 type of multi-curves and genus four, 378. And in genus five, there are already four and a half thousand types. And having a table of similar kind of 4,000, uh, four, four and a half thousand pictures with associated rational numbers does not give too much information. So one have to do something, one have to extract those topological types, which appear really frequently and those which dry up. In terms of square tile surfaces, the very same questions can be formulated on the following way. With what probability a random square tile surface of genus G has one, two, three, et cetera, singular horizontal leaves as this blue horizontal segments, well, graphs uh, on the right picture. Now, with what probability a random square tile surface of genus G has one, two, three, et cetera, up to three G minus three maximum horizontal cylinders. So they are represented by red on the left picture. So in, for example, for this square tile surface, we have uh, one, two, three, four cylinders. So they are colored in different, shaded in different shades of gray, not in 50, but in four. Uh, what are the typical heights of the cylinders? And more generally, what is the shape of a random square tile surface or large genus? So that's uh, the questions. And the last reminder formulated in slightly different terms is that the answers for multi-curves are exactly the same as the answers for square tile surfaces in the sense that the probability that the random multi-curve on the surface of genus G has exactly K components is exactly the same as that the probability that the random square tile surface of genus G uh, has exactly K maximum horizontal cylinders. Okay, so that's the setting. And finally, I can arrive to answers. So, here is a portrait of a random uh, reduced multi-curve. So we take a random multi-curve, we erase uh, the weights M1, et cetera, and K. 
we keep only gamma one plus a center plus gamma k, and we ask what is k and how do this gamma one, et cetera, gamma k, gamma k look like? First statement is that these gammas look like drawn on the picture. They generate k independent cycles in homology of the surface. So they just, you can view them as curves going around independent handles of our surface. So this is the first statement. In particular, their disjoint union does not separate the surface. If you chop the surface, you get a single component, uh, connected component with probability, which tends to one as genus tends to infinity. So for surface of high genus, if you take by random a multi-curve, forget about weights M1, et cetera, and K, and chop the surface by the resulting curves, gamma one, et cetera, gamma K, what you get is still a connected surface with a boundary. So this is part of the statement. And the second part of the statement is, what is the number of these components? Well, one cannot tell exactly what is this number because it can vary. But at least what one can specify the range in which this number varies for a random multi-curve. And it is morally, it is around log g over two. So, I started my lecture saying that I'm presenting this story from a point of view of an engineer. From point of view of an engineer, log g is just a constant and not very large. I don't know what is your experience. I never worked with surfaces of genus more than 10 hundred in my life. And I thought that I would not even go to 10, 10 sorry, uh, 10,000. Uh, 10, I, I was very much surprised when I had to work with genus 10,000. And I was very much surprised that it's still treatable. It is sort of, it takes enormous amount of CPU to, to make experiments with surfaces of genus 10,000, but it's still doable. But for genus 10,000, log G, well, I compute it all the time and I forget it all the time. But anyway, it's, it's something 10,000. Anyway, it's some small number, right? It's, it shouldn't be log, log 10 is slightly more than two. So for 10,000, it, it should be less than 10. So, and when you divide by half, so basically for a surface of reasonable, any reasonable genus, you take by random a multi-curve and you see one, two, three, four, five, probably six connected components, that's it. In principle, if you take uh, the decomposition of a surface into pairs of tens, you have three G minus three curves. So for genus 10,000, you can have up to 30,000s of curves. You never see them. They, in large genus, they become so rare that you never see them. And even worse, since the, there is this separation story, they become really very, very rare. So all what you see is multi-curves as on this picture. Now, this interpretation in terms of multi-curves, interpretation in terms of square tile surfaces might be even more surprising. So if you consider a random square tile surface without conical points of angle pi of large genus, it has about log G over two cylinders, which is very small with respect to what it can have. And what is to my mind really surprising is that with probability, which tends to one when genus goes to infinity, all the conical points sit at the very same level. So this is exactly the opposite of intuition of Morse theory, where all critical points are supposed to stay at different levels. Here, they insist to stay at the same level. There are plenty of them. There are 4G minus four uh, conical points. 
and they really want to accumulate at the very same level, and there are cylinders which join this level to itself. So this is the answer. Can I ask you? Yeah, absolutely. Because this is we, we right finally to to key to keep to key point of, of the whole lecture series. Yes. Am I right that there is only one component on, yes. on the picture on, on yes. the Yes. Um, you mean if you cut the surface by all these black curves, yes, then what you get is, is, is a surface with boundary with a single connected component. Absolutely. But uh, you said that it separates the surface with probability zero. So yeah, we so. get only one component every time? Uh, yes, as, and there is no contradiction because if so, if we would have curves which would separate the surface or collections of curves, then we would have two connected components, and I claim that it happens very rarely. Okay. So it is coherent. Do, do, you, do you agree? Yes. <laughs> Good. So this is part of the statement. Now, now let's discuss the weights, coefficients, and one, etc. Sorry. Um... Yeah. Uh, uh, could we go back to the, Absolutely. the claim about, yeah. Yes. Uh, I want to understand the claim about the conical point sitting at the same level. I'm assuming mm -hmm. that this means we're ignoring the conical point of angle pi, but all the other conical points sit on, no. on the same level. Uh, for simplicity, for simplicity, I consider only the situation when there are no conical points with angle pi at all. So in terms of Instead of MGN, I'm considering only MG. I see. Considering in terms of quadratic differentials, instead of considering meromorphic quadratic differentials with simple poles, I consider only holomorphic quadratic differentials. Mm -hmm. I okay. think that this is sort of a restricted situation, but I parameter N makes life more complicated because the portrait of a random square tile surface uh, depends not only on G, which is one parameter, which I assume to be large, but on the interplay between G and N. When mm -hmm. N is small, then everything seems to be more or less the same. But if N grows, if G grows and N grows, then you have to be very attentive on the rate of growth of, of one parameter with respect to the second. So I prefer already this requires several levels, sort of there, there are several limits involved. And mm -hmm. I decided not to avoid overcharging the talk. So you see, we are already playing the following game for any fixed genus to define random properties of random multi-curve or random square tile surface, we already have to pass to the limit, speaking about multi-curves to the limit with respect to the bound for the length, when we speak about square tile surfaces with respect to the bound for the number of square tile surfaces. I oh. do this limit, I memorize mm -hmm. it, and then I study behavior of this limit on the parameter mm -hmm. G when G tends to infinity. Mm -hmm. And if, if I would put in more parameter, it would be, become a nightmare. Sure, I understand, yeah. And um, when you say same level, we really mean to as like, a, like as a translation surface, you can yes. find? Yes, yes. So okay. They, they belong to the very same singular horizontal leaf uh, mm -hmm. of their horizontal foliation. So all okay. leaves except this one, so all leaves are closed, but there mm -hmm. is only one leaf, which is singular. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you take out cylinders, you get just a single connected, so uh, ribbon graph. Mm -hmm. One more way to, 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 to describe this, the associated stable graph, 
Mm -hmm. graph associated to a random square tile surface mm -hmm. has just single vertex and certain number of loops with probability mm -hmm. plus to one when G tends to infinity. And this number mm -hmm. varies in this range with probability which tends to one when G tends to infinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks. You are very welcome and please don't hesitate to ask questions because this is really the, the aim of the story to give a picture of, of random multi-curve or random square tile surface. And now I'm presenting you the, the, the portrait. So the next slide describes properties of coefficients M and they're funny. First, a random integer multi-curve like this, I'm not assuming that it's reduced, it's any, uh, has, so, sorry. Consider the following setting. Let's consider random integer multi-curves like this, but I assume I impose a bound for K. I consider, for example, k at most 10. So it's sort of a conditional probability. I'm not considering, I apologize, I'm not in the, in the first part of the theorem, I'm not considering all multi-curves. I consider only multi-curves where the number of components of associated uh, reduced multi-curve is bounded by some number, say 10. In terms of square tile surfaces, I consider only square tile surfaces having one, two, three, up to 10 maximum, maximal horizontal cylinders. So I consider only subset like this, and then I take a random object there. The claim is that with probability which tends to one as genus tends to infinity, all the heights of the cylinders or what is the same, all the uh, weights M1, et cetera, MK of our multi-curve will be equal to one. So it would be primitive on the nose. The primitive multi-curves, uh, if you consider only multi-curves with bounded number of components or only square tile surfaces with bounded number of cylinders, the heights of cylinders are equal to one, the weights of multi-curves are equal to one. Now, this is conditional probability. Now let's consider all multi-curves. This time, honestly, all random multi-curves. Then in this setting, uh, all the coefficients M1, M2, et cetera, Mk are equal to one with probability which tends to square root of two as genus grows. It's not one anymore. It's approximately 70% of cases, but there is remaining 30% for which you will see coefficients different from one. Now, if you ask how often all the coefficients M1, et cetera, Mk of a random multi-curve are bounded from above by an integer M, then the answer is square root of M over M plus one as G tends to infinity. For example, if we use one, this is the question when all these guys are equal to one. So this is the previous part. We have one over two and square root of this. Square root of one half is the same as square root of two over two. So this is the same number. So this answer and this answer is coherent. However, so you see, for example, if we take M equal to, to hundred, then square root of 100 over 101, this is already fairly close to one. So with high probability, all coefficients are uniformly small. And still, if you compute the mean value of M1 plus et cetera plus Mk, it is infinite for any genus G. So rarely there you see multi-curves, which have large coefficients mi or the total number of bands of squares 
in a random square tiled surface is in average is fairly large. Okay, so this is one more piece of information about random objects. And uh, yeah. K here is fixed. Uh, here not. So here you take a random multi curve. Uh, yeah. And so K is state, random. K is random, yes. Mm -hmm. K is the, the mm -hmm. one which you get picking mm -hmm. a random multi curve. In the first part, you, you restrict mm -hmm. K to, to some bounded mm -hmm. domain. In the second, no. And this is why you see the difference. So here mm -hmm. with probability, which tends to one, all coefficients were equal to one. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you release this condition that K is bounded, it's only square root, so it's only 70% which you get mm -hmm. instead of 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, the mean value of the number of components and the variance. And actually we have a formula for, um, if you wish, for, for all moments. Mm. Or rather for, to be honest, we have quite explicit formula for all cumulants. So, and also we know actually fairly extremely good approximation of the corresponding distribution. So here's the, the formula, but probably I would not since there is no much time remaining, just believe me that all these formulas mean that we have extremely good knowledge of the distribution. So when people try to prove some results about asymptotic behavior of distributions, they, they are already happy when they have some, so there, there are different rates of convergence. So morally we have fantastically good rate of convergence to some distribution, which we can write down explicitly and which is just a slight variation of Poisson distribution. So there is a whole theory a whole piece of theory in probability theory, which is relatively recent. And the name of this piece of theory is called uh, Mot Poisson approximation. So now let me recall how can we get all this. So what, what is the background, how, how these results were obtained? First thing which we need is this uniform asymptotic formula for intersection numbers of psi classes due to Amol Agarwal. So when we stated this as a conjecture, I don't know how about my collaborators, well, Peter might have different opinion. I never hoped to get an answer so fast. I hope that it's sort of doable, but I thought that it would take several years. So the conjecture was stated in, in August 1919, and the proof appeared already in April 2020. I should say that Amulga Agarwal is incredibly smart person and I love the way he proved this thing he used. So I showed you at some point the recurrence relations and his idea was to analyze this recurrence relation. Relations, they were three terms. So he proved that one of the terms, the most sophisticated one dries up this was more or less clear to all the experts, but then he showed that the two remaining terms, they, they are there, but one sort of mimics random work with probability two thirds and another mimics random work with probability one third. So basically he applied random work approach to absolutely deterministic recurrence relations. I think that this is a beautiful approach. So, and since the random work was asymmetric, so you move to more complicated partition with probability one third and to less complicated partition with probability two thirds, then in the finite time you arrive to, to, to the end where you already have good approximation. So this is one very important ingredient. Uh, another important ingredient is using our formula and uh, this approximation for uh, for intersection numbers. Agarwal managed to prove our conjecture for asymptotic 
number of square tile surfaces. So it is, or rather for coefficient in there. So the, the number of square tile surfaces tiled with at most n squares is n to a certain power, which is easy to compute. It's just the dimension, the dimension of corresponding space. But to compute the coefficient in front of this power, this is already quite a work. And for this, we have to analyze this sum with respect to all stable graphs and to extract what stable graphs are really important and what not. And this was done by, by Agarwal. And now the very last thing which I want to tell in the remaining five minutes is that actually the distribution which we get and all these frequencies of square tile surfaces, multi-curves, they're closely related to random permutations. Except that now you have to, in this particular context, you have to consider random permutations which are with probability measure, which is not uniform. So let me construct this crazy measure on the set of permutations. The construction is actually relatively easy, or rather very easy. First, you choose any collection of positive real numbers. Let's de denote them by theta k. And then when we have a permutation uh, with cycle type, cycle of length one present mu one times, cycle of length two present mu two, mu two times, etc. So we define the weight of such permutation in the following way. We take this first parameter, theta one, power mu one, theta two, power mu two, etc. theta n, power mu n. So plenty of these powers are equal to zero. That's fine. But this product is a positive number. So now we can sum all this weight. So we, we associated a weight to each permutation. The number of permutations is finite. We take the sum of these weights. We get some total weight uh, W capital. And now we define the probability to choose permutation sigma as weight of sigma divided by the total weight. So with such normalization, now the sum of probabilities is equal to one. So we define the probability. Uh, so the probability on, on the set of permutations. And now the probabilities vary from one permutation to another. So if all these theters are equal to one, then it corresponds to the uniform measure on the sum. If all theters are equal to some constant alpha, the corresponding measure on the set of permutation was already started. It was Evans measure. And playing with this parameter alpha, you can make, uh, depending on the value of alpha, you can make permutations which have many cycles more probable than in a uniform case or less probable. So this is the way to, to somehow to tune up the probabilities of permutations with, permutations with different number of cycles. So in our particular case, uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that if you use any collection of parameters theta, that there is a simple formula which computes what is the probability to get a permutation having exactly k elements in its cyclic decomposition in a product of independent cycles. And this problem, this formula is here in this first line. And another way to write this formula is to write formal power series, uh, adding one more letter z. And this formula is equivalent to this formula. I'm getting out of time. So you can forget about the second one. This formula gives you the probability to get, uh, to take a random permutation with this funny uh, non-uniform measure on the set of permutations. 
and to get the permutation with exactly k cycles. The formula is absolutely elementary. It can be, it, it, the proof takes two, two, paragraph, two paragraphs. Does not require anything is accessible to high school students. Okay, so now you look at this formula, you memorize it, and then you do the following thing. So I arrived to the very last slide and I can present the idea. So first following Agarwal, uh, you have to make a serious analysis of this sum with respect to the stable graphs and convince yourself that stable graphs with two and more, more vertices basically do not contribute. So that such uh, square tile surfaces or equivalently multi-curves appear very rare. Then this is already enormous achievement because now you have to study only stable graphs with a single vertex and certain number of loops. All these stable graphs have sort of similar structure. You have a formula in terms of intersection numbers of psi classes, which provide your contribution of stable graphs of this form. You use this formula and you plug in this formula, the asymptotic expression for intersection numbers of psi classes due to Agarwal. Now this already combinatorial thing, Let's forget temporarily about the error term, pretend that it is equal to zero. So you plug this thing in the formula, you simplify, and miracle. What you get is exactly this kind of sums for very special value of thetas. So as thetas, you have to take theta k equal to value of zeta function at to k divided by two. So for this particular parameters theta k, these contributions of stable graphs with a single vertex and k loops gives the same expression up to this error term which comes from approximation of intersection numbers as probability to get a random permutation with k cycles in this very funny with this very funny probability. Then the last step is you just use the technique which was developed around 95 by Huang for the study of random permutations to prove what was some convergence of the resulting distribution. So he was basically starting uniform measure on the set of permutations, but his technique is applicable it is quite general, so you have to tune up a little bit this technique, and then you have to use complex analysis to study the properties of corresponding generating functions. Here, magically, miraculously, for this very strange cho choice of weights, the corresponding generating functions are, can be explicitly written, so you get gamma function involved, and then you study properties, you use properties of gamma analytic properties of gamma function. So you know where it has zeros, poles, and so on. So, well, where it has poles. So, uh, and you're done. And I'm done also. This is exactly one hour. So thank you very much for your attention. And I thank all their, all their devoted listeners of the, of the school. And I thank the organizers who survived two weeks of the school. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much, Anton. Uh, thank are you very there, much, Anton. Are there any questions or remarks? Yes, yeah, so you see, there are the real audience. <laughs> thank you for your attention. Um, I do have a question. Um, can, can you go back one? Yes. Uh, one slide. This one? Uh, one more, one more thing. This one? Sorry, the screen's not up. Uh, maybe one more. <laughs> Sorry about this. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, it might be. Okay, Just one more, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So, so the correlators are, are just like, um, 
Uh, okay, so you're just taking the side classes. Okay, so okay, uh, so you, um, I'm trying to understand something. Uh, because before um, you were talking about like uh, those asymptotic behaviors uh, was for um, when you don't have uh, pi cone angles. And um, these, these uh, correlators are for when uh, mm -hmm. there are n. Um, so, so are you fixing n and then, and then doing something so, or? or this uh, now we have to look at the magnifying. You're asking a question about sort of the interior of this formula for the count of square tile surfaces. And mm -hmm. this is the following. So the ingredients, so the, recall the way we counted square tile surfaces. Suppose that mm -hmm. two, for simplicity, as, as was told, that our square tile surfaces do not have cone angles pi. Mm -hmm. They're no. Still, to count them, we perform the following procedure. Or I can, I actually, yeah, I have this slide. So we, chop our square tile surface like on the right picture. For mm -hmm. cylinder, we take the waist curve of the cylinder, we take out of the surface a tubular neighborhood, and we decompose our square tile surface into a collection of ribbon graphs. Mm -hmm. To count this ribbon graphs, I have to use this volume polynomials. So I, in this, sorry, this picture is bad because there are these cone angles here. Sure, sure, yeah. But, but for example, oh, probably I have it. Yes, for example, here, here, mm -hmm. here they are, well, it's not squared. It, they are no. But I can imagine that I took like the pair of pants in the middle uh, and then took a, another copy so, of it upside down so and then glued it. That, that's the point. So for example, for here, when I decompose mm -hmm. the surface, uh, into a pair of pants, as you say, or here. Mm -hmm. So the polynomials which are involved would be N03. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are two copies of sphere with three boundary components. So there would be two polynomials, there would be a product of N03 times N03. And when mm -hmm. in volume polynomial N03 already involves intersection numbers, for so mm -hmm. th that's intersection numbers not for genus two but for genus zero okay with non-trivial n with n equal to three mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the point is that when you decompose your surface which initially did not have quantities mm -hmm. of angle pi when you decompose mm -hmm. these blocks then mm -hmm. the blocks, so for, so the the more relevant the most relevant Actually, fr from in, in light genus, my claim was that the guys who survive is this one and this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you, for example, here, when you open this up, you get surface of genus one with two boundary. Mm -hmm. So the corresponding polynomial is N12. And mm -hmm. it already uses all intersection numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to use this intersection, more sophisticated intersection numbers. You gain okay. genus, but you gain in genus, but you you pay with n appearing. Okay, I'm still trying to understand because um, I guess like uh, a simple closed geodesic in this case um can be shared between two different connected components. Um, so then you have like two side classes that they're, they're sort of corresponding to the same curve. I'm, I'm maybe confused about that, but okay. I'll get to the real question I'm trying to ask. Uh, maybe that we can answer that without uh, and I can figure out this at some other point, um, which is the 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 relationship with um, with this probability distribution of partitions. Is there a combinatorial interpretation? Because 
um, you, I mean, you're not breaking up the surface into pieces because you only have one vertex. Um, so, yeah. I should say that it's quite frustrating for me. Mm -hmm. The only way we see this tie with random with non-uniformly random permutations is mm -hmm. bringing two formulas to this form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do not see how instantly on the nose to recognize mm -hmm. the permutation from a random square tile surface or random multi-curve. What is even mm -hmm. more frustrating for me is at least for me personally, maybe for Petian, it's less or for Vincent Delacroix or Elise Goujard. But there is analogous so story about random square tile surfaces corresponding to abelian differentials to when mm -hmm. both relations are orientable. And we have a conjecture that for their absolutely analogous results, maybe mm -hmm. conversions would be not as fast as here, but slower, but still that the corresponding distribution corresponds to the distribution of usual random permutations with uniform measure. We have no mm -hmm. slightest idea how to prove this conjecture. We do not have slightest hesitation or doubt that the conjecture is true because this is where we played with services of genus 10,000. So we made approximately two years of CPU time of experiments uh, there mm -hmm. from genus 80 to genus 10,000. And mm -hmm. it's enormous statistics and these statistics corroborates this condition, uh, this conjecture very, very well. We have no idea how to prove it, despite mm -hmm. that here there are random permutations on the node, just steering, steering numbers of the first kind. So mm -hmm. simple minded mm -hmm. random permutations, no idea. I would okay. absolutely love to, to see their simple minded explanation why random permutations are responsible for, for, for this kind of objects. But with, with uh, quadratic differentials, at least, you see, there, there are these crazy weights. I do not know if we would not have, if we would not already have formulas, I do not see how we would ever guess these kind of weights. But I okay, think so like these weights uh, hmm? look very similar to um, numbers which appear in Mazzucani's original volume computation paper, right? Uh, I'm not sure because I haven't looked at it in years, but um, I would be I extremely like... grateful to you if you would, if you can give me any kind of reference to concrete paper of Mirzahani to concrete part of the paper of Mirzahani, I would be happy to reread it because I do not recognize it in the, in okay, the I, paper of Mariam. I'll, I'll check later, but I think it's um, in the part where uh, like she's actually trying to do some explicit computations near the end. Oh, yeah, I see. Now I see. Yes, yes, I agree. So this zeta values at in even integers, they do appear in calculation of coefficients C gamma, which are her. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And they appear naturally because she has to sum up with respect to, uh, like I'm, I'm counting the sums with respect to the height. It's the same mm -hmm. way theta of two appears in computation of number of square tile surface of, of, of toric square tile surface. Yes, yes, I agree, mm -hmm. I agree. So one can, one, yeah, at least I agree that they, are, they appear naturally here. Mm -hmm. Artificial, okay. yes. So they, they, they pop up here and there because of these sums. Yes. Okay. And um, can you show me page 17 again? So, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I think at the time when I saw this, I was going to ask how how you guys managed to prove the, the big O order term. But then I think maybe on the next page, you explained that it was from um, Agarwal's uh, result or something like that, or I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, that, that big O term 
take it a little more seriously. Uh, you mean this one or that one? The lower one, yes. The lower one. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, they're both mysterious. And anytime you have a big, big this, order. The, this one, we have, we had to sort of, we had, we had to work a little bit with estimates of Agarwal and push them mm -hmm. a bit more. Be mm -hmm. wanted, so here, this, this is exactly this uh, Mont Poisson convergence. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a bit technical, so I don't want to bother everybody with. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's it. I'll, I'll go find your paper and then. Okay. And I would be happy to answer your explicit questions guiding how to which part of the paper to read and what what to do. This is so. This is the the paper is this preprint. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome.